Recording in progress. Hi everyone. Um, can everyone everyone hear me in the room? And hopefully people on Zoom can can see the slides. Uh, so yeah, uh, first I'd like to thank the organisers for the for the excellent conference and for giving me the opportunity to to present some of my work to you. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm Adam. I'm a, I'm a postdoc at uh, University College London in the group of Dan Brown uh, as part of the the UK's quantum computing and simulation hub. Uh, today I'm going to talk about some work I've been doing as part of a collaboration between uh, quantum computing researchers, including myself, uh, and some crystallography researchers, uh, also based in the UK. Uh, so the research concerns uh, a quantum annealing approach to solving what's called the, the phase problem in macromolecular crystallography. So I should, I should get started. So, so first of all, the, the people involved. So the, uh, the collaboration is between two so-called CCPs, or Collaborative Computational Projects. Uh, I'm attached to, to CCPQC for, for quantum computing, uh, and the other people involved from CCPQC are at the bottom, and uh, some of them are, are here today, obviously. Um, and the people at the top are, are part of CCP4, and they are the, the crystallography researchers. Now on to the to the substance of this this talk. Ah, sorry. So now on to the uh, to the substance of this talk. Uh, what is what is macromolecular crystallography? Uh, so macromolecular crystallography is concerned with understanding the the structure of uh, biological molecules such as proteins or, or viruses, DNA, etc. Uh, and this has uh, many important applications, uh, including in biological research, you know, understanding how the the machinery of nature works. Uh, and in, in medical science, uh, understanding the, the mechanisms of viruses and, and other diseases and, and how to tackle them. Uh, and it's also key to the, to the drug development pipeline in, uh, in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, however, uh, given, the, given the small size of these molecules, uh, it can be difficult to, to study their structure directly. However, uh, under, under specific conditions, many of these molecules of interest can be forced to, to crystallize into a regular structure, uh, and then shining X-ray beams at the sample from a, from a scientific light source, such as the, the diamond light source that we have in the UK, uh, can produce a, a diffraction pattern, and this diffraction pattern encodes information about the, about the crystal structure. Uh, now, much of the early work in macromolecular crystallography was done in the, in the early to mid 20th century by, by researchers, in, including uh, Dorothy Hodgkin, who studied uh, proteins, in, including insulin, uh, and by Rosalind Franklin, who looked at RNA and at DNA, and uh, obviously by, by Crick and Watson, who, who, who studied DNA. Today, there is the, the protein data bank, uh, which contains more than 180,000 uh, molecular structures, uh, many of which were found via macromolecular crystallography. And this resource has enabled um, many modern accomplishments, including the, the recent uh, alpha fold model from DeepMind, which is now being used to, to predict the structure of, of proteins. Um, so to be specific, the goal of macromolecular crystallography is this. Uh, so we want to perform that X-ray diffraction experiment and, and collect the diffraction pattern. Uh, and from the information contained in that diffraction pattern, uh, we want to construct uh, a map of the electron density for the target molecule, which tells us uh, what its structure is. However, there is a particular problem with doing this, uh, which is called the, the phase problem. The, the equation that relates the electron density to the X-ray reflections looks like this. Uh, the row on the left-hand side there is the electron density uh, at real space coordinates X, Y, and Z. Uh, and the measured X-ray diffraction intensities go into this equation via the amplitude term here, uh, which I've shown here in blue, and those HKL numbers are the, the reciprocal space coordinates uh, for the, for the, for the re particular reflection. Uh, however, this is not the full story. Uh, there are also these phases, these phase terms that appear in the equation, and the diffraction pattern doesn't provide any information directly uh, about these. Uh, so how can we find them? So uh, classically, there are a number of approaches that are used to find these phases. Uh, firstly, there are these so-called direct methods, uh, which involve exploiting phase value properties uh, coming from the relationship uh, between diffracted intensities. And this is sort of the, uh, the approach we're taking with the quantum annealing, uh, so I'll come back to this in a bit. Um, uh, secondly, there are experimental methods that exploit phase signals from naturally occurring or even uh, deliberately introduced heavy metals or other large atoms uh, in the structure. 
Thirdly, there is the so-called molecular replacement. It's, it so happens that proteins that are evolutionary, evolutionarily related to each other uh, and which perform similar tasks will have a similar structure. So if the structure of such a related molecule is known, it can be used to give an initial approximation and, and to the target phases, and they, and they can then be uh, refined. Now, uh, while these methods are all useful, they, they all have their limitations. Uh, in many cases, they can take a very large amount of computational or experimental effort uh, to perform. Uh, and sometimes they, they may not even be possible to do at all. It turns out that the, the phases are the most important term in the calculation of the electron density map. Uh, however, it's also the case that their estimation tolerates quite a high degree of inaccuracy. Um, so, for example, uh, even reducing the precision to the point that you only have uh, two options for the phase values uh, can still produce a map that's, in, that's interpretable. So the, these two figures here demonstrate this. Uh, so the top one shows uh, a map produced by the correct phases for, for some molecule, uh, where the, the, the blue regions in that, in that uh, top figure are the electron density, and the bottom figure shows the same structure, but with the phases fixed to the nearest of two allowed values. And as you can see, the, the shape of the electron density regions are, are changed somewhat, uh, but, but overall it convincingly, shows, it convincingly shows the same structure. Um, and now this, this lack of required precision led to the idea that this could potentially be an application for, for near-term quantum devices, uh, including, including annealers. Uh, so the, the reflection phases are not all independent of each other. They are related through the, the, the scattering from the, from the crystallized structure. Uh, and in particular, there are specific triplets of phases that have an approximate phase relationship. Uh, so for, for triplets of reflections, whose reciprocal uh, space coordinates are related in the way shown here, uh, basically if the, the reciprocal space vectors add to zero, then those three phases should add approximately to zero. Uh, now this, uh, this relationship holds best when some conditions are met. Uh, so it holds best when the amplitudes are, are large, uh, that is to say when the reflections are strong, and it also holds best when the, uh, the reflections mean that the atoms are, are, are fully resolved uh, with, you know, with a resolution of, of around you know, one angstrom or better. So with that, I can, I can come to the approach that we are trying. So we're, we're trying to formulate this triplet rule constraint uh, in such a way as to be suitable for, for quantum annealing. So to do, uh, to do quantum annealing, we need to, to formulate our, our problem as an Ising Hamiltonian uh, so that we can, we can program, it on, program it onto the annealer. And in general, that, that looks like this. It's this equation that's been in, in most of the talks. Um, uh, yeah, so we, we have these, these quadratic um, two-body terms with, with coupling coefficients uh, j, j, k, uh, and, uh, and the single-body uh, terms with field coefficients h, h, j. Um, and then the first step for, for writing the triplet rule constraint in this form is to use the qubits to represent uh, the angles. Uh, so we discretize the angles and represent each one in, in binary form using some number n of, of qubits for each. Uh, and then we can write an angle variable operator like this. Uh, this operator has two to the n evenly spaced eigenvalues basically going from minus pi to, to pi. Uh, and a problem that sometimes arises uh, with, such a, with such a binary encoding is that the, the coefficients can, can sometimes get quite large and can saturate the, the dynamic range of the annealer. Uh, but given the lack of the uh, required precision, there's no reason to think that this number of qubits per variable n would need to scale uh, much with the, with the problem size. So, so it, it will hopefully be, be okay. Um, anyway, now that we have our variable encoding, uh, we can get a quadratic Hamiltonian for, for each suitable triplet uh, by simply adding the three variables in that triplet and, and squaring them. Uh, and then to get the full Hamiltonian, we can just, we can just sum those. That was an overview of how the Hamiltonian is constructed, uh, but there are some more details that are, are worth mentioning. Uh, it's the case that not all possible triplets should be used. Uh, as I said before, those triplets with the, the strongest reflections uh, are the best ones to use, as these are the ones for which the, the triplet rule should be best satisfied. So we can set uh, a threshold and use only the, the strongest triplets. And in fact, it's choosing which triplets to use based on, based on these reflection strengths that is unique to the, to the particular structure. And without this, we wouldn't actually be using the, the diffraction data in, in constructing the Hamiltonian. The, the values don't explicitly appear. Um, I presented. Um, so uh, it's also true that not all phases are independent. So, for, uh, for example, phases which have oppositely pointing reciprocal space vectors uh, should have should have opposite phases. 
And there are some other symmetries that exist for, for some molecules, but we've, we've not considered this in, in much depth yet. Um, and the, the final structure will also have a, a three-dimensional real space translational freedom. That is, the, the crystal structure is still regular, regardless of where you put the origin. Uh, so we can also try fixing three independent phases in order to set that origin. Um, uh, going back to what I said about the triplets with the strongest reflections being the most important, uh, even, after choosing uh, it's a, even after choosing the triplets based on the threshold, uh, we can also then weight the triplet terms that we are using according to the, to the reflection strength. So we could do this uh, just by including the product of the strengths of reflections as a weight term when we, when we sum up the, the triplet Hamiltonian. Uh, so on to checking whether the, uh, the problem Hamiltonian works. Uh, so far we've considered a, a small molecule uh, with some fake diffraction data generated uh, numerically from the real structure. And then we've, uh, we've used classical simulated annealing to, to test the Hamiltonian. Uh, to, you know, to answer the question, do low energy states work well in terms of giving phases that translate into, into sensible structures? Fortunately, it turns out that, that some of the low energy states do. So these, these two pictures here demonstrate this. So uh, on the left is a picture of the true structure. Uh, the picture on the right shows some low energy outputs. So the, the blue regions in that, that picture on the right are the electron density of the real structure, so basically the same as is in the, the figure on the left. Uh, but the red and yellow regions show electron densities calculated from uh, low energy outputs from the, from the simulated annealing. Um, and it, it can be seen that although there are some erroneous regions, there is quite a lot of overlap between the, between the predicted structures and, and the real structures. So on to what we hope to do next. So, so firstly, it seems that uh, not, not all of the low energy outputs give sensible structures. Uh, so this begs the question of, uh, can we bring more, uh, more physics into the, into the cost Hamiltonian to maybe, maybe rule some of these out? Uh, on a t an alternative um, to this, which I've I'm convinced could be an alternative based on discussions with the, with the crystallography collaborators. Um, so perhaps these are sensible structures in disguise, sort of. So perhaps that some of the substructures are correct, but they could be sort of wrong relative to each other. And if that's the case, then they could maybe be used to, to, to bootstrap classical algorithms. Um, secondly, uh, we should try different levels of discretization. So uh, in the example I showed, uh, we used um, uh, n equals we used n equals four qubits per reflection. Uh, but perhaps we can we can get away with using fewer, or maybe it will, maybe we need to, to use a few more to get to get the results better. That's something to to investigate. Uh, and then, of course, we want to to try it in practice. Um, for example, on on a D-wave device. Uh, so it's not entirely clear whether the, the small examples that we that we looked at so far whether they might be a bit too large uh, still for, for the current devices, given the need for the, the minor embedding and depending on what uh, level of discretization we, we need to use. But if that's the case, then we could, we could obviously still try some of the, the hybrid solvers that are available. Um, and we could also try creating some, some toy model structures that will fit on the D-Wave more cleanly in order to, to test this a, a, bit more, a bit more thoroughly. Uh, yeah, and that's everything I want to talk about regarding this. So uh, thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any, any questions. Sure. Questions? Uh, could you go back to the slide where you define the problem? In the, the problem Hamiltonian like this? Uh, the computational problem that you're trying to solve. Um, yeah, well, so, so the, the computational problem is, is, to, to, take, is to take those take that diffraction data and turn it into an a electron density structure map. Uh, and an approach that, is, that may work here is, is, is through this triplet rule. Um, and this is an approximate relationship, and we're using this as the basis for our optimization. Um, I'm not a crystallographer, so I don't, I don't really understand the, the physics of this. Uh, this, this. Right. What I'm trying to understand is what is computationally hard about this, and why do we, why do we need quantum computers to do this? Um, the crystallographers tell me that it's computationally hard. They, 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 the approaches they use work well for, for, small, uh, for small molecules, um, but then unless, unless they can find some uh, initial guess, like maybe, maybe through those molecular replacement things that I mentioned at the beginning, uh, if they can't find any information about that, then sometimes their procedures just don't work at all. Um, and, and so right, but if, if you try to map this to some well-defined computational problem, um, that you know, is, can be hard. Is it? Can, can we associate a complexity class with it? Um, 
so I, I don't know the answer to that. So, uh, I mean, as far as I know, they haven't tried the exact analog of this classically ever before. So we're, we're, we're thinking that maybe if this doesn't work, then at least we could, we could maybe come up with some kind of inspired algorithm or something. But um, I, don't, I don't know what the complexity would be. I mean, the, the form of the Hamiltonian turns into looks like it, it may well be uh, an NP-hard problem in the same way as many other combinatorial optimization problems are. Um, but yeah, um, obviously in, in its native form, it's not a discrete problem, so that could, that could change things there. Um, so yeah, those are my thoughts. The short answer is I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> Thanks for the talk. Um, it seems to me that to map the problem into a Kubo, you need to discretize the angles, but then you use SA. You could have used SA directly in the continuum, right? Sure. Uh, I mean, the reason, the reason we used SA um, was because we, it was a, an easier way to investigate the low energy states of the Hamiltonian that we intend to eventually to apply on, uh, on, 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 a, on a quantum annealer. Um, so that's why that's why we, we, we use the, the Hamiltonian the discrete, discretized Hamiltonian form of it. But yes, certainly applying the continuous version with a classical optimizer would be a good idea. And as far as I know, that approach hasn't been tried classically yet. So that's another avenue. Yes. Thanks. Any other question? Uh, so, uh, actually, a similar question to what uh, Daniel asked. So, what you are writing here is a linear equation, right? So, if you are trying to solve linear equation on quantum annealer, then it's definitely a misuse. But maybe you can, uh, like, you had the slide where you described how you embed this problem on a quantum annealer. Um, so, uh, so I actually so didn't understand uh, wh what is in this equation more than the linear equation. Could you clarify? I mean, so it, it does look like a linear equation. I mean, it, 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 because the, the values, because this sum can be positive or negative, we square it in order to put it on the, on the, on the device and it becomes quadratic. Um, That's correct, but the question phi t1 plus phi t2 plus phi t3 approximately equal to zero uh, is a linear question, right? Uh, yes, I, I agree. Um, I mean, so you're suggesting that... Um, then probably we need to talk with crystallographers to figure out uh, what problem is actually hard in that regard, because this problem does not look like a hard problem. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, that there's a bunch of overlapping overlapping constraints here. So, so these same terms appear in, in multiple different. Um, but at the end, there's a system of linear equations in modular arithmetic model or two pi, right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a that's a good point, and I should probably I should probably talk to the crystallographers about that. If uh, no more questions are there. Let's thank the speaker once more.